Hey everyone, I'm Josh, the Teen Services Librarian from the Billie Jean King Main Library. And I'm Carl, I am the Library Assistant, normally at Dana, but I am currently at Eldo to go right now, which is exciting. Yeah, are you getting a lot of people? We are, we are getting tons of people, and the Halloween books are flying off the shelf. I'm so glad that we're doing this now, because I'm not sure what books would have been left to discuss how we waited. Yeah, so, right. <laughs> perfect timing. Good timing. Um, so welcome back to another episode of Read yeah. This is the Long Beach Public Library's monthly book discussion that highlights new books, uh, but also goes over some old favorites, um, especially from the teen collection. Uh, this is airing every third Wednesday of the month. And for this month, we're going to be looking at spooky books in Ooh. the Halloween season. <laughs> Halloween books and our, our sassy ghost. Yes. Read ya. She read you. Read ya. <laughs> She's so happy. So uh, all the books that we're going to be talking about today and a few more are going to be tagged in our catalog. Uh, just use the tag read ya, R-E-A-D-Y-A. 1020 and uh, our catalog is encore.lbpl.org. Um, so do you want to just jump right into it? Let's get into it. Okay, so I actually have um, like my top five. And when I say top five, I don't literally mean like of all the books I've ever read, these are the top five scariest or whatever. But I do have like, I, I think I made some good selections. I'm going to start with what I consider to be the least spooky. Um, or scary. Let me see. I'm going to start with Skeleton Man. I'm going to get to do my beauty guru thing I've always wanted to do. I'm a real um, vlogger now, guys. Look at that. Look at that. And Shade, Skeleton Man. Um, this book is actually kind of cool. It's actually in our middle school. It's not um, YA. It is middle school. And it's um, told by the protagonist is also in middle school. Um, she's part Native American. Um, which is unique because you don't get a lot of characters who are First um, Nation people. Um, and this book is really short, so if you're not a big reader, maybe this is for you. Also, if you're not really into being, like, terrified, this is for you. Um, the Skeleton Man book is... It is told by a middle schooler, so if you're, you know, not in middle school, you may find it a little cheesy, a little, you know unrealistic but the descriptions of the actual villain and the sounds and the just uh, pretty much you know like what are those the adjectives and <laughs> the book are pretty amazing like the way the skeleton man is described as walking towards the door like things are super imaginable i found myself halfway through like imagining the sound in real life which you know freaked me out um doesn't take much to scare me, to be honest. So like, but I enjoy it. I enjoy being scared. Um, but it just doesn't like you don't have to put a whole lot of effort into it. I found this story really well rounded. I think this is great for people who may be interested in something spooky, but not wanting to get the wit scared out of them. Um, this is just a, a like maybe a book club book, or if you want to tell stories in the dark, I would definitely recommend this one. Um, for the YA audience, just because it's so descriptive and um, interesting. So that's my first book. That might be. Oh, and this is actually by Joseph Bruchak. I keep forgetting. Oh, the, oh yeah, I forgot. I... Person wrote it. <laughs> they get some credit too. That's true. They did. They did do the work. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking that's probably the only book from your recommendation recommendations that I'm going to read because I don't enjoy being scared. I. I'm a, I'm a giant uh, chicken. I can't do it. <laughs> See, I love being scared. I just don't love being like, there's a difference between scared in the moment and like terrified for life. Um, so like, I don't want to be scarred. I want right. to be scared. Like there's an extra R makes a difference. Um, so yeah, that is, and it, the books do just get like worse. So, I mean like <laughs> scarier. As, Good to know. As, so that's fine. Skeleton Man is for everybody. Cool. Um, I'm going to jump into mine. I don't know a good way to segue this because they're not super related, but uh, this one's called Lobizona and it's by Romina Garber. Uh, she actually, I, when I was doing some research, she actually wrote books under a pen name and Romina Russell, the Zodiac series. So yeah, so Lobizona is, uh, it's uh, the first book in a new series. Uh, the main character is Argentinian. Her name is Manuela. 
uh, so they, they immigrate from Argentina to Miami um, and just kind of all the kind of social stuff that comes with that. Um, but Manuela is a little different. She has these really uh, unique eyes. They're through the, in the shape of stars and there's like speckles in them. So she can't really go outside. She has to like cover her eyes with like really special sunglasses so she isn't noticed. Um, but then one day her, her mother is actually uh, detained by ICE and um, so Manuela is kind of on her own and she has to um, kind of make her way in the world on her own and suddenly discovers that she's actually descendant from a special line where um, the seventh daughter is a bruja, which is like a witch, and the Ooh. seventh son is a lobizono. So it's like a male werewolf. Uh, so she's kind of in this, in this dual existence of being like, um, undocumented, but also like sort of in, in her like fantastical world, like not, um, it's kind of like, that's not really like the norm. Like usually the, the boys become werewolves and the girls become witches. So the fact that she is a lobizona, so like a, a female werewolf, uh, it's a little unusual. So she kind of has to like navigate the politics of the magic world, which I guess is also not, uh, what? Yeah. That's so a lot on one place. So like, not only you a, 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 a woman existing in a male space, which you know is hard enough, you're also like she can't catch a break. That is, yeah. no matter where she's at, she's contending with Stuck. yeah, so the horrors of society, which is the yeah. real where the real horror happens, guys. It really and, does. Yeah, it does. <laughs> I don't know why it said that like it was a joke, but like really, real life is awful. Um, mm -hmm. But at least again. At least she's a werewolf, so she can, you know, kind of right. handle situations like that. That seems, I don't know, but um, I don't know make that trade like social issues. I, I you know, actually, I would take being a werewolf right now. I, I would take being a werewolf. I take that. Like everything that's happening when I get to be a werewolf. All right, I, I, I take it. Yeah, it seems pretty cool. Um, yeah, it's like a scared girl. So the, um, the world she kind of immerses herself in is really like Harry Potter adjacent. There's like this magical world and, and there's like a school. Um, so uh, definitely look out for that one and look out for the series, which is going to be um, kind of coming out in the next few years, hopefully. And, and from what I've read from it, it's, it's um, even though it has these like really heavy social issues, it is like pretty, um, I don't want to say light because that kind of you know, makes light of like a difficult situation, but it, it, it has like a sense of optimism that, that um, okay. is like super helpful now. I mean, I, you know, how else are you gonna face the world? Yeah, that's good. That is good. I'm gonna actually check it out because you know, I have really been looking for a um, alternative to Harry Potter. Okay, so I am moving straight on into Sabriel by Garth Nix. Um, this is also a book that I read when I was in middle school. When I was in middle school, this was actually classified as middle school. Now it's teen, which I think makes more sense. It's an older book. I'm not going to say that old, how old it is, because, yeah, I'm not going to tell you how old this book is, because that will let you know when I was in middle school, and I'm not that old. Like, you know, just this book is still good. It still has a great story. Um, it's about a young girl, and she lives in this fantasy world where – Half the world is pretty much separated. Half of the world runs on like technology, and it's a very like um, the word I couldn't think of yesterday that I finally came to me. Of course, after we were done talking with steampunk, it's very much like um, a weird society where things run on like steam. Like they have nothing plugs into anything. Everything's like a mixture of 18th century technology, but also um, you know, some futuristic aspects. But the other half, the half, the half called the O Kingdom, um, is run pretty much by magic. And they have these um, bloodlines in the O Kingdom. And, and the time that this book takes place, those bloodlines have been broken and lost, but these bloodlines had very important things to do. One was supposed to be the king. The other one was supposed to be these people that see the future, so the kingdom stays on the right path. And then there's like a, the really important one, and what Sabriel comes into is this bloodline called the abortions. And what they do is they use necromancy along with charter magic, which is uh, magic. I don't want to give it like a designation because I'm sure you could do awful things with 
with it <laughs> and people do in the book, but like the the magic that's on the up and up, we'll call it that. And um, they use that to sort of make sure dead things stay dead because if you have a world run by magic, you will learn that zombies and necromancers become a big part of that. In every book I've ever read, when there's like magic, eventually like a, there's a necromancer involved. I don't know why that is, but it's like a trend. Um, so she comes from that line and the book starts with a bang. Her father shows up as this horrific monster to let her know things have gone awry and she needs to go to the old kingdom and start piecing things together. And she's thinking she's going to find him and just, you know, he's going to take care of all this. And it turns out it's not that simple. Um, I really enjoyed this story because it touched everything for me. It was like a coming to age story. It was like, you know, she's thinking about going to college and, you know, she's been raised in this part of the world where there's technology and like things are simple and, you know, magic is sort of like, you know, not really believed in and now she's being thrust into this other world where she's actually from it's just a lot there's even a little romance in here um and of course there's like monsters you know there's there's um things horrible things out to get her the dead will come back to life she she has to overcome so much it's not traditional horror i don't think i wouldn't call it that but despite the dead coming back to life and like eating people um it does read more like an adventure. Um, so if you wanted something in between the two genres, I really recommend Sabriel, again, by Garth Nix. Also, a really good series. There's two more books in the direct series that follow, that complete the story, and then there's several other books that sort of complement those three books. Um, and the last one came out as recently as, I want to say, three years ago was the last addition to this so again not that old guys not that old <laughs> do you like his world building over the course of the, did you read the series his world building is i mean like it felt like at some point like this might work like i was like maybe i should get a bell because that's what she used that's what the the necromancers use in that world and like to scare ghosts away i'm like maybe i should get a bell i was like i don't know i think maybe i, I felt like i needed one after reading it i was like they do so much with them, like just in case. <laughs> it's so real. So the rules make sense. He never is never one of those things where like I didn't catch any plot holes. It wasn't like you know why would a two hundred year old vampire go to high school? Twilight. Um, <laughs> like there's no pl big huge plot holes. You know it's mm -hmm. just like really smooth transition. Um, the characters grow and like sort of stay true to what they set out to do. Mm -hmm. um, it's really good. It's a really good series. I, I reread it every like couple of years. That's how good it is. Cool. Yeah, that, that one sounds good and again up my alley. Because you mentioned Necromancers. So I'm going to talk about The Walking Dead, uh, The Dead Come to Life Ooh. in uh, Deathless Divide. This is the sequel to Dread Nation. So it's a series by Justina Ireland. Um, she also wrote, if you're, if you're like into like following authors, it's another horror one that sounds really cool. It's called Scream Sight. Um, and it's sort of like, like kind of tech horror. She's like, it's like a website where people post like amateur horror videos and like things kind of just go out of control from there. So if you're into horror and, and you like her writing, you might enjoy that one. But um, back to Deathless Divide. Uh, so it is sort of like an alternate history horror kind of book where uh, it's set um, sort of in just after the Civil War. They had to end it early because uh, in the middle of Gettysburg, a bunch of zombies just kind of started rising up, you know, go figure who, who could right. imagine why that would happen. And couldn't imagine, couldn't see that coming. Yeah. Uh, so uh, <laughs> they, they pass an act because America is America and um, young um, black and indigenous, fo indigenous folks have to sort of go to these schools to, to fight these zombies. They're called shamblers. So this is the sequel, this is a follow-up. So the two main characters, uh, Jane and Catherine, have escaped from this really twisted um, small town. Um, and they are on their way to California. They, they think that California is this ideal place where all of their problems are going to be solved. But for anybody who is familiar with zombie uh, fiction, uh, that is never the case. Um, but they, they are onward they journey. Um, it's a really strong book. Like the characters are like really strong female leads. Um, it's um, for those of you who are like into this kind of thing, it's an own voices book. So it's, you know, black characters written by a black author. So that's always nice uh, when that is the case. Um, 
And uh, yeah, she does a really good job of like blending like layers of social commentary, racial commentary, but like still tells this like really amazing story. And like, you know, there's, if you're into this kind of thing, just a bunch of zombie killing. Uh, so, you know, it's got, got a bit of everything. Um, I recommend that one, yeah. I had to say, I have loved a female fighter protagonist since like, I was a big, again, don't date me, but I was a big um, Buffy fan. Like that was it. I had to watch every episode. That is, that is my jam. Yeah. Um, so I think we're just gonna stick to zombies for a bit because my next book is also zombies. Um, and again, this book is called The Forest of Hands and Teeth, which already is um, a, a, like what, I'm not a forest you wanna be in. Um, the angsty teen makes it worse. Like she is so Avril Lavigne, first CD right there, that's what we're looking at. Um, and this is by Carrie Ryan. And Carrie Ryan is, um, she. The first of all, this is a series and Carrie Ryan does a lot of YA horror. She's actually in another book I have in my list um, as an anthology, but this book I chose simply because it is, um, it's another coming of age story, um, sort of like The Walking Dead meets an Amish society because these people live in this small little town and like they have adapted pretty much to what they call the unconsecrated, which is um, the, the dead, zombies. And um, But things have not, been this way for so long that they've sort of forgotten what the world was like beforehand. Um, the, the protagonist doesn't know anything but this town, but her mother remembers the ocean. And she tells her like the, the, the unconsecrated, they haven't reached the ocean. They, you know, there's a place beyond where you can go and it's safe. And like we just discussed, that is never the case. It is never the case. Um, I just, I don't want to do any spoilers, but like, Zombies don't really need to breathe, so this whole ocean escape thing is not the best thought out plan <laughs> from the beginning. But um, they, she meets the boy, angsty girl meets the angsty boy, and they sort of rebel. And um, just, I also like the realism in this one. In this one, it it brings into light things that you would have to really worry about in a zombie movie, in a, a place where you have gotten used to the dead how careful you would have to be um, in different social things that come up when you are living in a, um, pretty much in a, uh, surrounded by a fence, um, because that's so un, uh, um, unsure way of living that they return to like this religion, you know, you start to keep things to make you feel like you're gonna be able to get past this and move on. Really interesting elements. And as far as actual horror goes, once she gets past the zombies, once you accept the reality that they do exist, it's not that terrifying. It is um, pretty pretty mellow. I would give this on a terrifying scale of one to 10, I'd give this like a seven. You never feel like you need to like put it down, but you're, you know, you're interested enough to keep reading. Okay, so my next one isn't about a zombie, but the main character is dead. So the next book is The Things She's Seen, and it's by Amblin and Ezekiel Kwe Molina. So they're um, Australian indigenous. Um, okay. Yeah, so that's, um, and, it's set, and it's set in the same kind of area, like the Australian outback. And I believe the character is, is half indigenous, half white. The book stars Beth, Beth Teller, who um, died under mysterious circumstances, doesn't really know how or why. All she knows is that she is still tethered to this um, plane of existence uh, no one can really see her but she's um still kind of attached to her father who um, she was close with um and he's a detective so um as she's kind of following him around he stumbles upon this case where a an orphanage mysteriously burns down and they're uh you know it's supposed to be filled with people but there's uh, only one body in the building and so they are kind of trying to figure out this mystery and kind of at the center of this is a an interesting enigmatic character named Isabel who can actually see Beth. So Isabel mm -hmm. kind of serves as like the medium between the two and um, it's really kind of this like um, 
the story of, of, of Beth sort of trying to um, kind of make amends with kind of the world that she left it and, and kind of help her father out one last time. Um, it's, uh, it's a good amount of like mystery and thriller. It isn't really like super horror. Like the, the, um, the protagonist is implied to be of otherworldly presence, but I won't get too much into that. Yeah, it's super cool. And, and it's kind of like a unique voice. Like it's not, there's not a lot of books written from that perspective. So um, yeah, it's a pretty cool, uh, pretty cool addition. I love the fact that they give her like a, a medium because it would be super sad to just have her like follow her dad as a ghost. Like that is, that it would be depressing, but they're able to like interact and have a moment of peace that is uplifting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so this from a level eight to a level 10. Um, we're doing Lord Loss and the Demonada. So, well, well, we said horror, so we had to get there eventually. Um, this is a horror book through and through. Uh, it follows the character of Great Grubbs Grady, and Grubbs Grady is a, I think he's in high school, but he's not too far along in high school. He reads like a, a middle school type um character but i think he actually is in high school um but it really doesn't matter because what happens is that he inherits his family's legacy which is you know not great he's not a witch he's not a werewolf he is just like pretty much cursed straight up every generation his family has to play a complicated game of supernatural chess with this demon called lord loss who is the description in the book is as terrifying as the cover and he pretty much torments the family. And if they lose the game of chess, he tears them apart. Um, literally they lose everything, including limbs and detail. There are entrails and all that happening in the first few chapters of this book. His family though, as you know, as books have it as, you know, these plots go, do not tell him this. They just sort of, since I think they only need a certain number of people to interact in this ritual, they decide to spare Grady and like literally send him to like, I think a movie. Um, I haven't read this in a really long time, but I know that he's like sent out on some innocuous errand and then like comes back and he finds out his family has lost this um, game and like they're slaughtered. So kid's not doing great. Um, and he's like, passed around by to eccentric relatives, to eccentric relatives, so he ends up with like this uncle character who had, like has all these secrets and is super mysterious and he starts like piecing together more about what happens. Um, and it turns out the uncle that he's with is trying to um, find a way out of this deal. And, um, cause who wouldn't like try to find a way? Like that's just not a good deal. Like this is not a something I want to do every generation. Um, so, I'll leave, I won't say too much about it because I do know that there are some twists and turns. This is by Darren Shan, and he also is the author of The Vampire's Assistant, but he has written a couple other books, and this series is actually quite long. I think it's like eight books, and it concentrates on Lord's Loss, and then they concentrate on other demons, because like Lord Loss travels with a squad. But I definitely would give this a read if you are ready for horror as the definition like in its true form sounds interesting i'm curious though why does it say why chess is he just like uh lord loss is just sort of like uh he just like likes games and like chess is an ever evolving game like it had to be a game that would keep a demon occupied for a couple centuries and i'm like so it couldn't be like connect <laughs> right. so it's like it's a a trope almost like a, you make a deal with a demon to get more time and then you have to do a test every couple of centuries, but very uniquely done. Mm -hmm. That sounds cool. Yeah, and the, 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 uh, the gore thing, I just, I can't, I can't do. I'm a, I'm a wimp when it comes to gore. I... <laughs> it was a bit much, yeah. The gore for me too was just like, okay, I get it. Yeah. But for people who like gore, this is calling you. That's your thing. Nice. My next one no relation to yours so i'm just gonna segue best that i can uh this one's called category five it's by anne davila cardinal it's actually okay. the follow-up to 
a uh, kind of a series. They're like loosely related, same characters, different kind of uh, narrative line. But this one's uh, Five Midnights. Um, but it follows uh, three friends, Lupe, Javier, and Marisol. They live in Puerto Rico. And it's set almost immediately after kind of Hurricane Maria hits. So they're um, you know, trying to rebuild. And, and um, when, um, of course, these greedy developers move in and try to you know, turn half of the island into, um, you know, like uh, vacation properties. Um, but at the same time, there's these mysterious murders that are happening. And um, they seem almost paranormal. And, and so it's kind of up to the three to really uh, kind of band together and solve these murders before another one can happen and see if there's any connection to this mysterious developer. Are they connected? I don't know. I can't say. You have to read the book. That is scary, especially for me. Um, I've always lived in California, so like I've never seen a hurricane. So that already, that natural disaster is already terrifying to me on a real life basis. That one in particular scares me because I don't even know what that would look like or, you know, you, you see, you read about it, but it sounds crazy. And then to also have to deal with the paranormal aspects. These poor kids in, in these books. So my last actual book that I am going to recommend, sorry, dropping the phone. It's called Slasher Girls and Monster Boys. And this is an anthology. It was edited by April Tulchlock. And, and it, it has some of the most prominent and newest um, YA horror writers, um, including the Carrie Ryan who did The Forest of Hands and Teeth. And her story is actually first. And it's completely different from what I read of hers with The Forest of Hands and Teeth. It's so good. The first story is about these these girls, and they sort of um, it's like this predator on their street. But he's like a very human predator. He's, he's like just being weird and creepy, and like every girl has um, dealt with this guy before. You no, know, pays too much attention to you, and you know, just a weird adult. And um, their reaction to that is very much um, strong, and it's very um, you know uplifting, but also very natural and very real. And um, in the first story, the this weird creepy adult comes home with a woman and these girls are just concerned. They're just like, what woman would be with late, the character's name is Leonard. It's like, what woman? She doesn't know, like we have to rescue her. And then they also react, something that was new to me is that we're, I'm so used to my um, protagonist being like Katniss Everdeen where they're just like, calm, study, I'm gonna overthrow the government, no big deal. They are not prepared. They're not prepared. Like they walk over to this guy's house to go ask for sugar as a way to get into their house. Obviously not a good ploy, it's been done before. And like they break into tears and freak out and do all, everything you wouldn't want to do on a rescue mission. <laughs> um, so it was super enduring to me. I was just like, that's what I would do. I'd probably break into tears if I had to confront a predator and try to rescue a woman. Like that would be my response. The spin on the one I was telling you about is that the woman he comes out comes home with turns out to be something unexpected. I won't give it away, but she is not what she appears. She is definitely not his victim. Um, so it is interesting, interesting. And the thing about anthologies is you can sort of skip around. If you don't like something within the first, like, three pages, um, don't read it. Read the next story. It's like a whole, whole, there's like eight other people in here. Um, dive in. So I'm definitely going to recommend this. That one, yeah, I might actually check that one out myself. Hopefully I don't get too scared. Okay, so my last one is probably, um, maybe one of my favorites from my selections. Uh, it's called Never World Wake and it's by Marisha Pessel. Um, so it revolves around five friends who uh, come together after graduating from school. They decide to kind of live it up for one last time before they all go their own separate ways. So they um, go to like this concert and they are planning on renting this house. And so after the concert, they're driving back to the house and their car is um, involved in sort of a near accident. So they veer off the road and um, they think everything is okay. Everything seems fine, no one seems hurt. But they actually have somehow ended up in this kind of alternate dimension called Neverworld Wake. And they soon find that the twist of this, this place, this other plane of existence is that they're stuck there. They have to relive the same day over and over again, kind of like that movie Groundhog Day. Um, and there's only one way they can get out 
they have to pick the one person who can leave out of the five friends. So uh, it's kind of like a really like nail biting thriller kind of mystery thing with some paranormal elements and um, definitely like putting yourself in that position where you have to make that choice is not a fun uh, kind of place to put yourself, but it's so thrilling and like interesting to think about. That sounds like a question I'm going to go ask my friends immediately. Like, if I was stuck in a place with you and we only one of us could leave, would you let me leave? Like, because I'm cutting people out. Um, right, <laughs> I don't right, right. need to write that. But I was also thinking, because we, we, did, we did talk about this one yesterday, and I was thinking it would depend on how bad that day is. Like, is it like, is that the day I win the lottery every morning? Maybe this wouldn't be the most terrible situation, but if every day I wake up and like, you know, my house is on fire or I have to like do a bunch of tasks, I, I might be looking for a way out. That's really a really interesting concept. Interesting premise, yeah. At least you have five other people. Like it kind of depends on how you are with your friends. I know I I might not have a great time after a certain amount of loops. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love my friends, but like you know, that's that's gonna wear on a person after you know the two. Yeah, I don't know who, and this is like forever, right? And 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 or just like, do I live out my natural life? I have so many questions yeah. for this fake one. That's really interesting. I think that one I will actually check out and read after I finish my anthology. Yeah. So yeah, because so that was an interesting premise. Um, I know I said top five, but I do have honorable mentions. Well, this one is straight up um, on the cover, literally says um, Hell World. And that doesn't get more descriptive than you need it to be, then there you are. Um, it is about a girl whose mother um, was a paranormal hunter. And it, her and her crew investigate this cave in the middle of Arizona, and they go missing. Um, and so, of course, that is upsetting because, you know, your parent goes missing. And, of course, like, where do you go in a cave? There's only so much space. And, you know, eventually um, she just drifts apart from her dad because he's depressed. And on her 16th birthday, she just decides to get with the kid who was her mother had a co-host. And the co-host has a kid, you know, how this goes off. They pair up and one's, you know, she's the daughter, he's the son. They get together and decide to go explore this cave. And, whew, I mean, talking about bad decisions. Um, this, this book was, um, this book will keep you up. It'll keep you, it's a, it's a pace book. You, you sort of don't see which direction this will go in until it gets you there. Um, and I definitely would recommend by Tom Levine. But this also, this other one I saw on the shelf is um, Life is Short and Then You Die. Again, the title is giving you what you came for. All these stories have to do with murder. Um, their first encounter with murder. Um, it says on the back, life is filled with first, first kiss, first job, first love, and your first dead body. And just the authors on the on the front cover, um, Kelly Armstrong wrote a really cool series for teens about shape shifting and a supernatural cabal mafia. Um, R.L. Stein, of course, has written nothing but horror for teens in middle school. Um, it is looking real promising. I know they say you don't judge a book from its cover, but that's basically what I did. And it's a, another anthology, so I like the fact that if I don't like something, um, I just move on past it. Yeah, I like that. I like that. So those are my honorable mentions. Nice. So uh, thanks so much for tuning in. Thank you, Carl, for being here today. I uh, hope those uh, selections kind of spooked you a bit and that you'll check them out. And of course, if you are interested, you can go to our catalog and search Readya 1020 and find those picks put them on hold and get them picked up through LBPL to go. So we will see you next month and uh, take care. See ya. Bye guys.